In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you once again for your presence in our life. And we thank you in a special way for this time of prayer. Knowing, Lord, that you stand at the door of our soul, at the door of our heart, and you knock. And as you say in the book of Revelation, if we open to you, they're knocking. You'll come in and sup with us. You come in and have a time of fraternal discourse with us, a family time, a meal. And in a meal, we look at each other and we enjoy each other's presence and we, we speak to each other. Lord, thank you for your personal presence in my life. Help me never to forget that you're with me and that you're all powerful and that you love me and that you, and you truly know all things. Nothing happens to me, Lord. Nothing happens in the world without your knowing it. And yet at the same time, you love me and you're all powerful. So whatever happens to me, whatever situation I get into, I can be sure that somehow it's part of God's plan for me. Somehow there's a way of living through it with trust, with generosity, living through it, especially with the sense that I'm not alone, that you, Lord Jesus, are with me. The disciples had experiences of this in the gospel. In the reading from this Sunday's Mass, we see one of these. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. This line is a great example for us, for our presence of God. Lord, we want to take you with us, just like these apostles take you with them into the boat to where, wherever they're going. So too, Lord, we want to take you with us into our life, and you want to be with us there in our life. Behold, our Lord says, just before, he's ascend, just before he ascends into heaven, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? What a wonderful scene, Lord, for us to contemplate in our prayer. And it's a scene that shows us, in the first place, our Lord's, our Lord's humanity. Jesus is tired, and Jesus, therefore, falls asleep. Lord, we too know what it's like to be tired to be sleepy, to need rest. Lord, thank you for the gift of sleep, for the blessing of rest. And help us, Lord, to, to rest well, to rest in your presence, to rest with the sense that you're taking care of us, and so we can shut off our concerns and worries and get a good night's sleep or have, have a nice Sunday where we truly recreate, we have a time for recreation with family, with friends, with things that we that we like to do. Of course, but also with time reserved for prayer on the Lord's Day. Great Pope of the mid-20th century who convoked the Second Vatican Council used to brag as Pope of how well he could sleep at night. 
And people would say, well, how can you do it, right? You've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. You, you're the head of the Catholic Church, all these problems, all these initiatives, all these concerns, all these crises. How do you sleep well at night? Right? They would think that he would be worried or anxious. And what he would do is he would, he would before he would go to bed, he would pray to our Lord saying, Lord, it's your church. It's your, it's in your hands. I'm going to sleep and I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> right? It's God's in charge. God's in charge of the church. God's in charge of the world. God's in charge of my life. And yes, he wants me to be concerned. Yes, he wants me to be responsible. Yes, he wants me to take care of the things that I need to take care of. But at the same time, he wants us to do it with faith, with hope. And so when the time comes for us to rest, we can put things in his hands. All of our concerns, any concern, no matter how big. Put it in his hands and not worry about it. And get some sleep, get some rest, and then begin again the next day. And our Lord is also very human here. When the disciples wake him up in the middle of his sleep, in the middle of his nap, just like us, he's not in a good mood. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't appreciate being woken up mid mid sleep. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, "Peace, be still." And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, "Why are you afraid? Have you no faith?" We hear a little touch of annoyance here in our in our Lord's words. That, that human side of him, who likes to be waken up out of a dead sleep? Well, not me. And, probably not you either so we see lord that in all things except sin as the letter to the hebrews puts it so clearly in all things lord except sin you're like us you get tired you need to sleep you don't appreciate on a human level being woken violently out of your sleep at a deeper level here of course it's so beautiful to see our lord Sleeping in the midst of this storm. A great storm of wind arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. How is it possible to sleep so soundly? How is it possible to not be concerned, not be affected by a storm which is very violent and causes the apostles to cry out in fear they woke him and said to him teacher do you not care if we perish so the storm was so violent that the apostles and, and several of them were were fishermen who were used to the sea this storm was so severe so serious that they thought they would die they thought perhaps they would be capsized and and drown in the sea and we too, Lord, come up in our life against times of trouble, times of severe testing, times when we don't think we have the resources to make it through. And our Lord was right there with him, right? He was taken into the boat just as he was with his humanity. And so humanly speaking, our Lord was in the same, in, in the same boat, right? He was in the same situation, a situation of danger, a situation of an impending and, and threatening death. And yet he's sleeping. Lord Jesus, what does this tell us about you? What does this tell us, Lord, about your trust in God? What does this tell us about the peace of your soul? Well, it tells us, of course, that his trust in God was very great. That he knew that he was, he was the... Son of the Father, the Son of the Almighty God, God Almighty, who knows all things, who can do all things, who loves him and loves us. God Almighty is his Father. And so even though there's a time of danger around him, he's at peace, he's still, he's calm. He's unperturbed. Lord, help me to learn this lesson. Help me to remind myself of these three great truths and they're truths that saint Teresa of avila would repeat to herself in her prayer and and 
encourage others to think about frequently. Lord, I know that you can do all things. Lord, I know that you know all things. Lord, I know that you love me. That he can do everything. He knows everything that's happening. And he loves us and he cares for us. That's a powerful combination of ideas. God is all powerful. First of all, God exists. God is real. God is more real than anything in your life. He's more real than your breathing right now. He's more real than the room that you're in. He's more real than the feelings that you're that you're feeling in your in your chest or your stomach right now or the feeling of your body resting on on the couch or the chair that you're sitting in. He's more real than the clothes that you have on right now. He's the source of all reality. All those things are only real. They only exist because God lets them, because he shares his, his being with them, because he holds them in existence. Lord Jesus, I believe in God the Father, in your Father and my Father. And I believe in your divinity. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. You really exist. You're really all-powerful. And he knows everything, right? He knows everything. So if anything happens, it's not it's not that, well, God is uh, asleep at the wheel, that God has taken his eye off the ball. No, rather, rather he's allowing it to happen for some reason that we don't know or for some good that may be apparent or, or not apparent. And if he doesn't intervene, it's because he's got good reasons for waiting, for not intervening. Just like Jesus lets them wake him up, right? And part of his providence here was to let the apostles go through a difficult time and have them wake him up so that he could perform this great miracle. Controlling the weather. (laughs) Who can control the weather? Peace. Be still. He says to the storm and to the lake. And it works. And there's a great calm. Great calm. Lord Jesus, the storms and the squalls and the waves that are kicked up in my soul because of the circumstances in life. Help me to be peaceful in the midst of them like you. Because like you, I remind myself that God exists, that God is all-powerful that God knows all things, and that God loves me, that he won't let anything happen to me that I can't handle with his grace, even the worst thing, right? Even even suffering and death and loss and what we call tragedy. And there are, obviously there are tragedies, but if we have faith and we take the long view and we're faithful to our Lord, they'll work out for our good, very much for our good. Pope Benedict XVI has a, has a very helpful reflection in which he comments on the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation's vision of heaven expresses what we see by faith at Easter. The lamb who was slain lives. Since he lives, our weeping comes to an end and is transformed into laughter. When we look at the lamb, we see heaven opened. God sees us, and God acts, albeit differently from the way we think and would like him to act. Only since Easter can we really utter the first article of faith. Only on the basis of Easter is the profession rich and full of consolation. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. For it is only from the Lamb that we know that God is really Father, really Almighty. It's a fascinating consideration, very helpful for our prayer. It is only from the Lamb, right? The Lamb who was slain, who went through the worst thing, who went through this tragedy, and yet lives, right? And yet lives again because his Father's care for him encompassed and and transformed that death. It didn't let that tragedy have the last word because God is all-powerful and God is and God is the Father of Jesus. Only from the Lamb, slain yet living again, do we understand that God is really Father, 
and really almighty. Jesus, of course, is convinced of the Father's love for him. In the gospel, he, he says simply, the Father loves the Son. What a wonderful thing, Lord, for you to say, because you have to keep it simple for us who aren't too intelligent. <laughs> the kiss principle, keep it simple. He says to us, the Father loves the Son. In another place, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And when we come across the cross, when we come across difficulties, tragedies, periods in our life of, of greater suffering, well, then we, we tend to doubt that. And we say, really? Is God really my Father? Lord Jesus, do you really love me as the Father has loved you? Are you sure? And when we look at Jesus' life, we see Jesus on the cross. And we hear his cry from the cross, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? We're tempted to ask about our Lord, Well, really? Is, is this really the Son of God? What kind of, what kind of father lets his son go through this? And then it's only in the resurrection, right, where we see that death, that suffering, turned into this great glory, this great victory, this joy, this happiness, this reward, which results from the passion lived with trust, lived with obedience, lived with generosity, right? lived thinking about others. When we see that passage from the defeat to the victory, from the ignominy to the glory, from the sadness and the suffering to the joy and the and the merit of the victory that's when our faith is vindicated and fulfilled this is what shows us that god is almighty god is all powerful and that god is father the father of jesus christ the pope goes on no one who has grasped that can ever be utterly despondent and despairing again. Grasp what? That God is my Father, that God is Almighty. Hey, this will let me sleep in the boat, <laughs> like Jesus sleeps in the boat, with all those screaming people around him and the wind and the waves. No one who has grasped that will ever succumb to the temptation to side with those who killed the Lamb. No one who has understood this will know ultimate fear even if he gets into the situation of the Lamb. For there he is in the safest place possible. Wow, what a thought. What a thought, what an insight. No one who has understood this, that God is their Father that, and that God is all-powerful, will know ultimate fear. Right? We'll know fear. Things will make us afraid. But fear won't have the last word. Why? Because we'll know how to respond to it. We'll remind ourselves that God is in charge. We'll remind ourselves that God is all-powerful. We'll ask ourselves how God wants us to live through this trying or difficult or fearful circumstance that causes us anxiety. And we'll keep praying and we'll keep moving and we'll offer that fear and suffering. And so the fear won't be ultimate. Right? The fear won't have the last word. It will be part of, of our own experience of God letting us suffer and then glorifying us because we imitate Christ, because we are other Christ, because Christ is living his passion again in us and through us. It's our share, as St. Paul would put it, it's our share in the sufferings of Christ, which leads to our glorification. And we need to die a death like his, to rise again to a life like his. No one who has understood this will know ultimate fear, even if he gets into the situation of the Lamb, for there he is in the safest place. What an incredible thought that the cross, when it's the cross that God really wants us to have, and not, as St. Josemaria would put it, the crosses that we invent with our stupidity or, or with just our lack of, uh, our lack of effort to live, to live a spiritual life to correspond to God's grace. And those crosses too are part of God's plan, right? They're, they're crosses of growth and we recognize them and almost immediately they go away because I realize, oh, I'm just suffering because I'm thinking about this the wrong way or I'm just suffering because I'm not, I'm not embracing the challenge of being alive 
and being human, being called to holiness enough, I brace it a little bit more. I, I think about this in the right way and it go and that suffering goes away. And so those, those crosses too, which are the crosses, so to speak, of our own invention are also part of God's plan for us, but we have to figure out, okay, these aren't real crosses. And so we put up with it gladly and willingly and they go away very quickly. But there are other crosses that are crosses that, you know, our Lord puts on us really to have us grow, really to have us have this experience and enter into this reality of knowing that he's the father and knowing that he's the father in the way, in the same way that Jesus lived by accepting the cross, by going through suffering, by being asleep in the, in, in the middle of the storm, because we're living through all that with trust and trying to embrace it out of trust and out of love. For there he is in the safest place possible. How could the cross be the safest possible place? <laughs> it's kind of, it sounds kind of ridiculous that the cross is the safest place. Well, spiritually it is because spiritually it's, it's where God wants us to be. The safest place for us is in God's will. The saints call God's will a, a, a divine harbor, right? a safe harbor. That if you want to be at peace, if you want interior calm amidst the storms of your life, you have to make a good effort to, to figure out what God wants you to do. Are you doing God's will? Are you seconding His will? Are you accepting His will as it's manifested in your vocation, as it's manifested in the commandments, as it's manifested in Jesus' teaching? Are we basically fundamentally in line with God's will? Am I in the state of grace? Is there some sin that has broken my friendship with God? Am I facing with a good effort, a good honest effort, not with perfectionism? The duties of my state in life. Well, if I'm doing all those things and I'm kind of accepting the difficulties that come with this faith in providence, this faith that God is my father, well, then I can be at peace, right? Because, because even though I'm on the cross, even though there is a cross, in my soul, in my mind, deep down, I know that I'm okay. I'm, I know that I'm doing everything I can within the limits of my imperfections. I'm doing everything I can to do God's will. Which means I'm in His hand, right? Jesus talks this way. He says that, you know, no one can take us out of out of his hand, no one could take us out of the Father's hand. That God the Father has put us into Jesus' hand. And Jesus says, no one could snatch them out of my hand. No one can take them out of your hand. What a wonderful way to think about our life. We are in the hand of God. We're in the hands of God. And no one can snatch us out of there. The only way we can get out of his hand is by jumping out of it. <laughs> right now, I'm... <laughs> I'm recording this from a summer camp in uh, Western Massachusetts, and I'm sure the boys will catch frogs or toads at some point. And if you got a frog or a toad in your hand, right, it's pretty easy to keep other people from from taking it from you. You just cover it up, run away. Let's say I catch a frog, and another camper wants to take my frog. Well. I'll just cover it up and, and leave. The danger, if you have a frog or a toad in your hand, besides the obvious danger, which also happens of the frog or the toad relieving themselves in your hand, is um, is that it'll jump out. Right, The frog doesn't want to be in your hand, doesn't want to be there, and so it jumps out. And this is really the danger with, with our life. This is the danger with our relationship with our Lord. And no one can take us out of God's hand, except ourselves, right? Because of our lack of trust, because of our sinfulness, our, our the part of us that's evil, that, does, that refuses to love, that wants to dominate, that wants to impose itself. And no one can take us out of God's hand, except of our lack of trust and our sinfulness. Even if it's the cross, if we're in God's hand, 
as Pope Benedict puts it here, it's the safest possible place. And the cross doesn't have the last word. We will not know ultimate fear. The cross leads to the resurrection, infallibly. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Teacher, do you not care if we perish? Lord, do you really love us? Lord, are you really going to take care of us? Lord, are you really going to take care of me? And to that question, Jesus responds, not just by reassuring them, but by using his divine power over the elements. He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? Lord Jesus, we have faith. Here we are talking to you. Here we are praying about your life. Here we are reflecting on on your love for us. We do have faith, Lord. But like that father of the boy that you that you cured, that you cast that demon out of, we have to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, but I can believe more strongly. I can believe more firmly. Lord, I can exercise my faith more, especially, especially in the face of, of the things in my life that cause me anxiety. What are the storms, Lord, that in my life that you're sleeping through calmly, <laughs> but I'm all worried about, all freaked out about? Well, that's precisely where I need to live my divine filiation. It's precisely where I need to, I need to remind myself that I'm a son of God. Precisely where I need to go back to those three truths of St. Teresa of Avila. God can do all things. God knows all things. And God loves me. Lord, I know you can do all things. Lord, I know you know all things. And Lord, I know that you love me. And then... If we do that, we'll experience this calm. We'll experience this peace. Even if the storm doesn't stop. Even if Jesus doesn't take away the cause of our consternation. We'll experience what St. Paul says, the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. It's a beautiful line. The peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. And what does that mean? Well, I think one of the things it means is, well, we'll be peaceful in situations where we never knew peace before. Like this thing used to bother me so much. This person used to cause me so much trouble. This situation I could never handle. And now it's not like the person has changed or the situation is that much different objectively. But we're more accepting and we're more peaceful. Not because we're indifferent. Not because we just checked out. No, rather because we checked in. We checked into the love of God. We checked into our divine filiation. We made an act of faith that all of this is is for our good, that it will lead to a, a great glory, a great a great merit in heaven, that it will be fruitful even here on earth because we are Christians. And so as Christians, we go through the cross to the resurrection and going through the cross to the resurrection proves to us that God is our Father. Just as it proves that God is the Father of Jesus. If we just saw the cross, we would say, God's not this guy's Father. And if we just saw the suffering, we would say, how God? How can this be the Son of God? But when we see the resurrection, we realize, oh yeah, well this, this makes a lot more sense. And all that suffering had a point, all that suffering had a purpose, all that suffering is made up for by eternal glory. Eternal joy. 
but we have to be patient, right? We, <laughs> we can't rush it. We actually have to go through our cross to get to our resurrection and go through our, our cross, Lord, as you did with trust in God, trust in God's plan and generosity and right? thinking of others. We go to Our Lady. Our Lady had this experience, right? Her heart is pierced with a sword. And then when she is, is assumed into heaven, she becomes queen of heaven, queen of all the saints, queen of the angels, cause of our joy. There's no joy like the joy of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our Lady, our Mother, help us to be more like your son, who, even though the wind and the storm was raging about him, was asleep. His trust in God was so great. He, he knew he was in the safest place always, which was in the hand of God the Father. Help us to, to put ourselves there, to pray from there, to live from there, to love the people in our life from there. Keep us always safely in the hand of our Father God. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me. In this meditation, I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.